The natural evolution of a society is to go out and explore. It's only natural that the next progression for the evolution of our species is to move off our home planet and out into the solar system. Here's the thing. Eating is the most fundamental basic thing after breathing. Part of what I'm doing is producing robots that can garden in space. How could it get any better than floating in space and eating a fresh strawberry? I can't really think of anything better than that. Heather Hava, and I am a PhD student at the University of Colorado in Boulder. I study aerospace engineering sciences and specifically in the field of bioastronautics. We really go into the depths of how you take care of living things in the space environment. So I would consider myself a space gardener or space farmer. There's so many things that we take for granted here on Earth that we have access to that compared to somebody who's been eating dehydrated food or camping food or MRE, meals ready to eat. That kind of food is great and can sustain you for a long period of time, but it doesn't give you the enrichment of all the sensory input that you can get from food. And those things are incredibly valuable to people at, here on Earth and in space. And it's in a little plastic container with some dehydrated asparagus, in this case I'll add uh, 50 milliliters of water to it, and uh, it takes five to ten minutes to, to rehydrate. Part of what we're trying to do is ensure that astronauts eat enough food, and one of the reasons they don't is because the food itself is not particularly as appetizing as maybe our meals here on Earth. Chocolate pudding cake. Looks like it too. We want to try to counteract that by bringing plants into the space habitat so that not only the astronauts can have better quality of food, better nutrition, but they also can have access to nature while they're away from the Earth. A graduate team here at the university got some funding through a program called the Exploration Habitat Challenge. We built a couple different systems. One of them we call Spot. It's Smart Pot. The other one we call Roger, the remotely operated gardening robot. And those two systems together can be used to grow plants in a space habitat. So this is Spot, and there's some, some unique features about this growth chamber. One, it's small and compact, and it can be moved around and placed almost anywhere in a space habitat. This enclosure right here allows us to control the environment and have a microclimate for the plant so we can adjust temperature and humidity. We have lighting that we can control individually for each plant and um, ventilation, so there's a fan that we can control. This is intended for the astronaut to actually be able to interact with the plant as well, so that's why the enclosure is clear. We want them to be able to see the plant and we want them to be able to get access to the plant. If the local user or the astronaut needs to get data uh, about the health status of the plant, they can come up here and use these buttons in the screen to actually look at what's going on with the plant over the past several days. But all that data is actually being sent back also to a teleoperations center where a remote operator can monitor control all the systems for the plant as well. We have a water reservoir that has the nutrients for the plants here. The water is recycled, so the water in the reservoir is pumped up, dripped onto the top, and flows back down along the roots into the root zone and cycles back into the reservoir. So that's how we're continually cycling the nutrients for the plant. Right here, we have Roger. Also, Spot is sitting on the forklift that you can see that Roger has on the front. So this mechanism is designed to be able to raise and lower spot and place it onto another surface 
basically Rogers a rover. It's designed to move around the habitat uh, on its own autonomously. It uses several cameras to drive. There's also another camera that would be on the arm of Roger that it could use for close-up inspection of SPOT. A SPOT unit can actually call for Roger when it needs a care task. The SPOT will send out a signal and call for Roger to come and service it. It can pick up a SPOT unit and move it to another location in the habitat. It can also refill the reservoir or inspect the plant and see if it's ready for harvest. The arm could actually harvest some of those leaves or fruits and take it back to the preparation area for the astronauts. People's misconception about robotic gardening is that you're trying to replace the human completely, but really it's more about enabling the optimization between people and the care tasks. If an astronaut goes out and does a spacewalk on Mars for several days and is not there to take care of the plants, we want them to be able to take care of themselves. But when the astronaut comes back, we want them to also be able to you know, harvest their own salad if they so choose to. Really, the integration between the robotics and the human is extremely important, and the foundation of that is first understanding how does the human interact with a plant and what are the things that they really get out of that interaction. The way we're going to do that is these small growth chambers, the smart pots, are going to be sent down to Antarctica. In that environment, it's very similar to a Mars mission. People that overwinter in Antarctica at the South Pole are there for a very long period of time. They can't come or go, and other people can't come or go to rescue them if something went wrong. They have delayed communications. So a lot of the environment is very similar to a long-duration space flight. People down there in an isolated, confined environment will actually be able to interact with the plants, and will be able to get data back and telemetry about the status of the plants and how well they're doing. We'll be able to know if the people are actually taking care of the plants and that they're doing well, and how much they actually interact with them, which care tasks do they enjoy doing, what are the actual benefits to their cognitive performance and their stress reduction that they get from interacting with the plants. And they have a greenhouse at the South Pole where they can grow fresh food. Lots of the people who are there actually enjoy going into the greenhouse, not only to see the plants, but to be able to smell the live living materials, see the color changes, feel the warm, humid air. Those are all things that in a space habitat would be somewhat of a rare thing for somebody to have contact with. You're in a very stark and sterile machine environment. One of the astronauts that's been on space station recently was taking care of a experiment called veggie that's growing lettuce and eventually other small vegetables for the astronauts. And they've reported that they've really enjoyed taking care of the veggie experiment. And they've also mentioned things that they would like to have it in other parts of space station and they'd like to see more of these plants elsewhere. Once that can be quantified, that actually could bring that break-even point where it's more expensive to ship all your food than it is to ship the equipment and the materials you need to grow your food. Some interesting things happening in the commercial space field today is we have companies like SpaceX doing amazing things with sending uh, the Dragon capsule up to space station. But it's been said that Elon Musk's original dream was actually to grow plants or have a greenhouse on another planet, like potentially Mars. And that's what led him down the path of doing commercial space flight and producing the Falcon 9 and the Dragon capsule so that we can actually realize that dream of having a greenhouse on Mars. If the Earth one day is no longer inhabitable, we can still continue to progress and evolve by moving off our home planet and out into the solar system. And the work that we're doing now is going to ensure that capability in the future.